donations uh, to help the relief effort for people in Ukraine affected by the current war. And our new Brothers Fellowship Ministry, and I am happy, very, very happy today to have Reverend Doug and Carolyn Gregan here with us today. Hallelujah. From New Brothers Fellowship, this is another ministry that we also support. Um, there are very special guests here today. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of background, uh, New Brothers Fellowship Ministry is focused on helping men and women who are in prison. They bring the gospel of Jesus Christ in prison chapels and jail cells. Uh, they share the word and the love of God, helping transform their lives. They do offer after care as well for the new believers who are getting out. They help them connect with uh, local churches and they help men and women grow spiritually. Amen. Hallelujah. And if you are a part of the body of Christ, um, can you raise your hand if you're a part of the body of Christ? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And you're a part of Jesus, the living word ministries. Amen. Uh, in Matthew 25, 31, 40, it says, Then the king will say to those, uh, to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came and visited me. Amen. So if you are a part of the body of Christ and you are a part of this ministry, this is also your ministry. Amen. Jesus the Living Word Ministries has partnered with uh, New Brothers Fellowship for about four years now. Uh, but even before that, our very own Pastor Kobe and uh, Pastor Luis uh, had been working with Reverend Doug and since 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and one of the key differences about uh, New Brother Fellowships are that they are solid in their faith and they're solid in the Word of God. And they do not compromise. They do not compromise. They are genuine servants of the Lord. And we thank you for that. Thank you. Because even though this, this ministry is also ours, they are the ones that are storing this ministry of New Brother Fellowship. Amen. So just to give you a little background, <laughs> I did a lot of research this week. <laughs> Amen. Reverend Gregan is originally from California and was raised in an atheist home. He is a musician and plays the saxophone. Uh, his desire, I don't think that's his desire any longer, but was to be a professional saxophonist, or maybe it still is, I don't know. <laughs> um, he moved to Boston to continue to study and continue to pursue a musical career in 1988, maybe, if I'm, my math is correct. Um, and of course now, you know, being in the city, away from your family, um, you know, from your natural surroundings, if you could say that, you know, God did a work on him. You know, sometimes God will bring you to a place where you cannot be bothered by anyone or anything else, just so that, she, just so that he can reach you. And at the age of 22, that is where Reverend Gregan turned to prayer and was confronted by God. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, and having, of course, already known his beautiful wife, who was born into a missionary family. She was born in Puerto Rico. And um, I, I believe it was during um, uh, one of those missionary trips, right, that... They had you in Puerto Rico, amen, hallelujah. Um, so they already knew each other. So I guess that God had already planned it all out, amen. God makes all things great. And he always has a plan for everything, hallelujah. 
So he called Carolyn and expressed his desire to give his life to Jesus. Amen. They got married in 1989. They have a daughter and they also have two grandchildren. Amen. And after, you know, giving his life to the Lord and getting married and, you know, he, be, he, he gave his instrument to the Lord and became uh, to do uh, worship, to do, um, to, to play his, his instrument. Uh, he became a worship leader. Amen. And in 2003, he had an opportunity to go and minister uh, with worship in at the Essex County Correctional Facilities. And it was there where God gave him a heart for the men that he was ministering to. Amen. Quickly began to work uh, with Chaplain Ray Paris at the time. I don't, I don't know if he's still around or not. But in those facilities in 2004, he entered the prison care ministry, which is New Brothers uh, Fellowship. And soon after that, was appointed the director of New Brothers Fellowship. And he and his wife, Carolyn, have entered full-time prison care ministry as home missionaries and have been doing it for about 18 years amen so glory be to the glory be to God I thank God for your lives and I thank you for all of the work that you have been doing and um, since we don't have a lot of time I please ask you to come up <laughs> and I am we are so happy to have you and please thank you hallelujah We've had a really good morning so far, great worship service. Our home church is New Life Assembly of God in Haverhill. So uh, this morning we were there, I, I, um, I play the keyboard there and uh, you know, in the worship team. And then Caroline does children's ministry. So first I was upstairs and then I was downstairs and then we drove. So we're glad to be here. Um, thank you, Lucy, where'd she go? Oh, there you are. Um, Lucy, thank you so much for your ministry, what God is doing in you, and your kindness in uh, doing the deep dive. I, I don't know anyone who knows more about me, other than my family and my wife, than Lucy now. All right, <laughs> she really, she really dove deep. I'm telling you, uh, which is great. You know, thank God, because the truth is that's how we get to know one another. Amen. If only the body of Christ really knew each other in such a way. That's why I love testimony testimony right testimony unites our hearts together because it's this mystery of Jesus coming and meeting us in our own story and all of us converge into the right the scripture calls us the uh, you know a temple being made you know made not made with hands and that temple knows each other we're connected in a mysterious way so what a beautiful thing um, let's see what do I want to do I think uh, what I'll do is just say first of all New Brothers Fellowship is a prison and aftercare discipleship ministry, right? So we're a spiritual support ministry. There are many ministries who do many things for people coming in and out of uh, correctional facilities. Our emphasis is Jesus. And so we have two core verses, right? The first primary verse is Ephesians 4.13. Until we all come in the unity of the faith to the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man or woman. To what measure? To the measure of the God, the person next to me? No, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what excites me, is thinking about God bringing me far beyond I could ever go myself. And God bringing us together far beyond we could ever go ourselves. And that, that statement, just by the Holy Spirit, is going to speak to our message today. All right? So yeah, we have we do di uh, discipleship. We have aftercare. I'm the I serve part time as the Protestant chaplain in the Billerica House of Corrections. Okay, so I work there three days a week, and uh, we have discipleship groups that are led by volunteers around Essex County and one in Middlesex County. And so what that is is the body of Christ coming together to minister and 
uh, disciple men coming out of correctional facilities. So we're thankful to be able to do that. My wife has chosen not to share today because her, her she's got a, like a health thing going on, right? A little challenge with coughing and so forth. We've been uh, we've been struggling with sickness actually for about four weeks. Thank God that we're uh, you know doing pretty good, but uh, there's you know you know how it is, right? Um, and so the thing that I want to share with you that uh, I know Lucy will will do will be diligent to uh, share a little more comprehensively and talk about getting involved is our, our mailing ministry. One of the things that Pastor Kobe, I don't even know if we've talked about it before. Uh, was it running the last time? Okay, so he knows all that. Um, do I have, am I good if I walk a little bit? Okay. Um, so we have a, a mailing ministry to correctional facilities around the country called Hope Mail. Hope Mail uh, goes across the country. We're sending uh, just over 500 subscriptions right now to well over 120, for, I think we're right around 130 correctional facilities all across the country. So it's very exciting. And one of the, one of the great things about Hope Mail is that it engages you, the body of Christ, in the mailing. And the way that we do that, Caroline puts all the mailing together, right? There's, you know, Christ-centered material, discipleship material, some nice fun things for guys to kind of lighten up. There's a, always a photograph, beautiful photograph with a scripture on it. And guys, you know, I had I talked to a young man uh, just a couple weeks ago, and he says, every, every month when I get my picture, I put it up on my window. Isn't that awesome? And so, so guys are, you know, they're, they're engaged. But in each of the mailings that we do, we strive to have a handwritten note from a person in the body of Christ to that individual. And that is one of the most powerful things that a man inside can receive. There are many men who receive no mail whatsoever, many women who receive no communication whatsoever. And so to get a handwritten note from someone that says, I, I'm praying for you, I love you in Christ. This I prayed and this is a scripture that the Lord gave me for you. I'm telling you the testimonies that have come back from this, just that simple note are very powerful. And they're, they're numerous, okay? So if you'd like to participate in that, we have uh, Spanish mailing, right? We have uh, Spanish mailing, English mailing, right? So, hey, I'm just saying it's a pretty good fit. Uh, now, Lucy said something, and I, I picked it up because I, when you're a visitor, you pick up on these things. She said, we don't have very much time. Is that true? I'd like to I'd like to go to the word can we go to the word the the Lord uh, did give me a message for today he gave me a message a couple weeks back and uh, I'm excited to share it with you today it's maybe not in the you know what is what is a what is an expected message a normally expected message I don't know but for me ministering this word I'm telling you it's unexpected the Lord spoke this to me, gave this to me, and said, I want you to share this, not just here, but to my home church in a couple weeks on Prison Ministry Sunday. Prison Ministry Sunday is, come on now, June 26th is Prison Ministry Sunday, and so uh, I'm sure that you will be, uh, you know, uh, amplifying prison ministry on Prison Ministry Sunday. But for us, I guess today, today is Prison Ministry Sunday, because here I am. You can't get more direct than that. Uh, we're going to pray because I really do need God to help us and, and help me to share this message. When the Lord gave me this message, um, I was very challenged because, because what I'm going to speak to you today is an invitation. It's an invitation into a life and a lifestyle and a call that I'm not currently living out. And the Lord confronted me with that. And he said, I'm, I'm calling you to speak something that, that you're not living. And very few of my people are living. But I want you to speak this invitation. And I want you to stand in faith and believe me to bring you where you can't go. Because we're living in a day and an hour, brothers and sisters, where we need the power of God that we will never reproduce ourselves. Now that may seem like an obvious statement. But darkness, as it's ever increasing, what does the scripture say? The light will always surpass the darkness, amen? Light shines in the darkness. The darkness could not extinguish, could not comprehend it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. 
you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Father, we come in faith today. I thank you for the power of faith. If only we would believe, brothers and sisters. If only we would believe what things God could do. Impossible things. I thank you for the power of faith, Lord Jesus. Lord, I believe in my heart with all confidence that this word is from you. I also understand, Lord, that you're calling me to simply be a vessel, as we are all vessels, filled with a heavenly treasure, that the excellency of the power and the glory may be of God and not of man. Lord, let that be what culminates today, that the excellency of the power will be of God and not of man. Let it be so. So I avail myself to you now. I ask you to just wash us in the blood, prepare the way for the entrance of the word. The entrance of your word gives light. We need you to quicken us, Holy Spirit. The natural man cannot receive the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. They're spiritually appraised. They're spiritually received. They, they, they manifest and break forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified, that your faith would stand not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Lord, we thank you for this. And I trust you for this as I yield myself to you and to my brothers and sisters here, thankful for this day and this opportunity. Join our hearts together, Lord God. Break down barriers. Any hindrance, any barrier between us and you, any hindrance and barrier between us and one another, I come against that in the name of Jesus. I loose us to hear the voice of God today and to join in, uh, the scripture says, uh, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Father, I thank you for uniting us now in faith as we turn our face to you and your kingdom. Let your kingdom come and the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. In this hour, in this generation, until you come, let the kingdom of God come and the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I thank you for this, Lord God. So, Father, we're trusting your anointing to break the yoke. We're trusting your spirit to quicken and bear witness. And we're trusting your power to meet us as we simply step out in faith and say, here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. I thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. title of my message today is looking for a weeping man looking for a weeping man or a, a weeping woman let me just say up front okay God is no respecter of persons amen God calls men God calls women God anoints men God anoints women so just understand for the sake of language and the sake of the message I use the word man here but understand we're, we're talking about all of us amen God is looking for a weeping man so I want us to think about the reality of God seeking after you. Do you know that you're being pursued? You're being pursued right now by God. God has a vision of us and a purpose for us that is far beyond anything we understand. If we only knew the things that God had prepared for us, right? Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So in this life, in this age, God is looking for his children to be his servants, right? In this life right now, in the age that we're living in, in, in 2022 when the world and particularly this nation is in such an incredible place of tension, God is looking for us to be his servants, for us to serve him. The scripture says he died for all so that those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him. So this is the call. That's why I say we're being called to, we're gonna be, I want you to think about thresholds, meaning simply lines that we use to restrain ourselves. We restrain ourselves from the voice of God. It's very common for us to do it. We don't necessarily do it because we're being willful, although I would submit many times we are willful, but so many things prevent us from crossing a line where the Lord would call us to go. We're going to talk about that today. Christ is a servant, all right? Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. 
And the Lord is looking for those courageous enough to truly know him as he is and to live out, live that out through the power of the Holy Spirit. So our focus here is uh, uh, apprehending the heart of God today. Listen to the statement. The Lord is looking for those who are courageous enough to truly know him as he is. What we're talking about is we're talking about separating our own measurements and our own understanding of holiness and righteousness and looking solely and exclusively to God himself. That's why the scripture says to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Because where Christ is and where we are is actually very far. Now Christ came to us and so he feels close to us. And we're living in a day and an hour and a generation where so much of the church is making Christ not just close to us, but he's met, we're making Christ like us. Did you hear what I said? Much of the church is making Jesus into their own image instead of being conformed to his image. That's a radical work, amen? And why do we do that? Because when God calls me into a place closer to him, I realize how unlike him I am. And when I realize how unlike him I am, I begin to tremble and I begin to, to break down and I begin to, to, my flesh begins to resist. It begins to resist. The Lord is looking for those courageous enough to truly know him as he is and to live that out through the power of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Chronicles, uh, uh, Chronicles 16, 9, we start with this verse. I'm sure you've heard it. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the whole earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the whole earth, that he may strongly support, or King James language, to show himself mighty, to show himself mighty in the midst of those whose heart is completely his. Now, the, the Lord is speaking to King Asa in that statement, and he says, and we're going to look at this a little later in the message, you have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. We're going to understand that statement in a little while. Okay. So, as, as we're getting introduced into this mindset of the Lord looking for a weeping man, we want to understand that we're being asked to have courage. You have to be courageous to serve God. You have to be courageous to trust the Holy Spirit because he's going to take us places that we can't go in our natural self. If all we did was serve God in our natural self, just think about how little would get done. Amen. How little would get done if we only serve God based on what we could do. No, when I worship, when these sisters are leading worship, they're not here in themselves. They're not here based on their talents. They're here in the power of the Holy Spirit. They offer themselves as a vessel and the Spirit of God touches them and they minister to you. And so it is with Pastor Kobe and so it is with all of you as you're out in the world and in the community. That's how you minister. It may seem very small in the moment, right? The, the power of God, the supernatural things of God, they're very small in a moment. When you say God bless you to someone in the checkout line, those are small events, but they're supernatural works of God if we'll see them, right? So we need the courage to ask God for his heart, to fear and worship him in the beauty of his holiness. Some of the people biblically who did this are Moses, of course, David, Josiah, all the prophets, the apostle Paul. What we're gonna talk about today is serving God in a manner that constrains us to his character. You know what the word constrain means, right? To constrain means to, to bind to. Okay? When I'm constrained, I'm bound to something. So listen to the statement. We're being called to serve God constrained to his word and his character. What that means is when his word speaks something, I don't say, no, I can't do that. I say, I'm bound to the word, therefore I'm obligated to go forward. Whatever the word says, I have to do it because I'm constrained to it. That's a powerful statement, amen? The world... <laughs> The world would change radically if the body of Christ would be constrained to God and his word, amen? amen? And his character, which is righteousness. Hebrews 1, 8 and 9, this is one of my favorite passages in the scripture. Hebrews 1, 8 and 9 says this, the scepter of your kingdom, O God, is a scepter of righteousness. The scepter, what is the scepter, brothers and sisters? It's the rod of authority. The authority that's necessary to govern, 
and to live out the kingdom will, plan, and power of God, all right? Now, we're talking about Jesus here in Hebrews. This is being spoken concerning the person of Jesus Christ. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. That's the character and the quality and the holiness of God himself. And then in verse 9, it says this. You, Lord Jesus, have loved righteousness, and you've hated lawlessness. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Now, I want you to think about these two sides. We have righteousness as the kingdom, the character, the holiness, the glory, the beauty of God in righteousness. That's what, that's, that's what you enjoy in the Christian life. The greatest thing that God gives us is the is the the capacity to comprehend the glory and experience the joy of righteous living. I have a brother that ministers with me. He said a powerful thing a couple days ago, or a couple weeks ago, I should say. He said, the goodness of God often is so incredible, we can't even, we can't even think, we can't even get close to it. In other words, it, it's almost like the goodness of God comes to us and we draw back. That God is so good, what he offers us is so powerful and so glorious that our inner man, we can't even deal with it. We'll draw back from it. Isn't that crazy? But that really lines up with what we're talking about here. Here we have a place where God is calling us. Obviously, eternity is going to be a righteous, holy place. That's where God is calling us to dwell. But the Bible says he also hates lawlessness, which is the very thing that opposes entering into the kingdom. Lawlessness and righteousness are in complete opposition. And so when Galatians 5, 17 says, for example, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit wars against the flesh, the two oppose one another, so you what? You cannot do what you would. That's the reality of loving righteousness and hating lawlessness. Every addict, every man that I minister to struggles with the tension of this. Because they can tell me and they can live a life that demonstrates a measure of loving of righteousness, but every single one of us, brothers, sisters, uh, brothers and sisters, to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ, there's lawlessness at work in us. When the Lord speaks, we say, no, not today. When I'm tempted to lie or, you know, maybe I, I need to tell a lie in a particular situation, I, uh, it's easier to tell the lie than it is to tell the truth. When the Holy Spirit says, why are you talking about your brother or your sister? You're gossiping right now. I say, Lord, I'm not gossiping. I'm not gossiping. I'm, uh, I'm interceding for them. I'm interceding for my brother and my sister, right? I'm just, I'm just, I just want to help them out because I, I got a handle on what they need. Think about the arrogance. So loving righteousness, hating lawlessness. What it means is we're wanna, we want to believe the Lord to bind us to constrain us to his word so that our love for righteousness will truly produce a hatred for all lawlessness. That's the great sanctifying work of the Holy Ghost. The sanctifying work of the Holy Ghost isn't just to transform you, it's to position you so that when lawlessness comes against you, you have an authority that says no. Not, it's not gonna happen. Okay. In Christ, these things have happened. Let me share them quickly with you. So as we're preparing, we're looking for a weeping man. In Christ, these things have happened. We've been purchased, number one, purchased. You've been purchased. Listen to the verses. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You're not your own. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Uh, for, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 22 and 23. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price, so do not become the slave of men. And finally, Revelations 5, 9 and 10. They sang a new song, hallelujah, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain, and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests and uh, to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So you've been purchased. Do you understand that? 
Do you understand your life is not your own because you were bought with a price? Number two, you were created for glory. You know this verse, Ephesians 2.10. We could say it together, right? We are his workmanship, masterpiece, created for good works in Christ Jesus that God has ordained for us to walk in. Amen? The, the third thing is we are compelled we're compelled by the work of Jesus Christ. We're compelled by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels us, King James language, controls us. The love of Jesus controls you, brother and sisters. It binds you to who Christ is. The love of Jesus constrains you to Christ. Having concluded that one died for all and therefore all died, and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but now for him who died and rose on their behalf. No longer living for ourselves. And the fourth thing is we've been apprehended. Apprehended. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, 12, not that I have already obtained or I have already become perfect or mature, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of. King James language. I apprehend that I may apprehend that for which I was apprehended for. You were apprehended for something. Now we need to be absolutely convinced of this because the generation that's out there dying right now needs us to be so. You see, here's our challenge today in the, in the ministering of this message. You're gonna already agree with it. The question is, are we gonna live it? That's where the Holy Spirit was dealing with me. The, the Lord says, Doug, I know you already agree with this. The problem is not your agreement. The problem is you're living it out to the degree that I say. The problem is you following me where I say go, that you speak to who I say speak to, that you do what I say do, that you pray and prepare yourself as a vessel that's able to go places that I wanna take you because I have things for you to do and I have servant, I have people that need ministry. They need deliverance, they need authority, they need the power of God. And, and in order for you to get there, you and I are gonna have to have a different level of encounter, okay? In this generation, in the final hours, final hours, this statement's gonna come up at the end of our message. In this generation, in the final hours and minutes before Christ's return, the Holy Spirit is sending out this invitation. This is what the Lord spoke to me. Who will serve as I served? Who will love as I loved? And who will declare my word as I am? Who will serve as I served? Who will love as I loved? And who will declare my word as I am? That's the question that's before us. Now we get to, as we just ask the Holy Spirit to continue to help us to understand the message, right? Looking for a weeping man. What does a weeping man look like? If you don't know what a weeping man looks like, then you don't necessarily know what the Lord is looking for. I'm going to use the person of Nehemiah as my little framework to share with you what a weeping man looks like. Nehemiah and Ezra together, powerful story, right? But uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read this, this passage from Nehemiah 1. I'm in Nehemiah 1, 1 through 10. If you want to turn there, you can. Of course, that would be wonderful. Thank God for people who use their Bibles. Amen. I'm not putting down the phones or anything, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Nehemiah 1, 1 through 10. Now, the Holy Spirit has to help me because one of the things that, that is that I believe is true for, for me in the, in, in, the, in the Lord giving this message to me is that it's essential that we hear from the word the things that the Lord wants us to hear. I can tell you about them, but that's not sufficient. The word has to communicate it, do you understand? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The anointing is gonna move through the word as we hear it, so we need that. And so we're gonna have some stretches here where we're gonna read up, you know, some passages of scripture that are a little substantive. I just, I'm speaking strictly in, in terms of length, but uh, we're gonna trust God to help me to edit as we go, right? Because obviously you generally prepare more than what you're able to give out in, a, in any given hour, amen? Let's read, 
uh, Nehemiah 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month uh, Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now day and night on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word, Lord, which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me, if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the remote parts of heaven, I will gather them from there and I will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. And then Nehemiah says in chapter uh, 1 verse 11, O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name. Make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. And Nehemiah says, I was the king's cupbearer. Okay, so we're gonna break this down. Seven things that we find in Nehemiah's prayer. Nehemiah is a weeping man. Nehemiah is a weeping believer. He's a, he's a weeping person of God, okay? Nehemiah sees properly. Nehemiah is constrained to who God is. He is not asking God to bend to, to who he is. Do you understand? So we're gonna, let's look, take a look at his prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to help us see what a weeping man looks like. What does a weeping man do? The first thing that I see is Nehemiah inquires about the condition of the people and the city and the temple. The first thing that Nehemiah does is he, he, he inquires of God and asks God, uh, or, you know, he's speaking to his people, but you, you, again, we're looking for a weeping man. So we're, we're talking interchangeably about what God is going to speak to me and how I'm going to speak to God. Do you understand that? Nehemiah inquires about God's people and the condition of the temple. Do you care about God's people? Do you care about the condition of the temple, the condition of the church? Do you care about where God's people are right now? Do you understand there are Christians who are living in bondage and brokenness and pain? They're living in darkness. They have no idea how to get out. There may be someone here today like that. I don't know. But that's how challenging the day when the hour we're living in is. Do you inquire of God and say, Lord, how, how are the people? Do you have a heart for that? Does it matter to you? And are you constrained to God moving you to the outcome? Because as soon as you ask something of God, God's gonna respond, amen? You see, that's the challenge, amen? Don't, don't ask something of God and not expect him to speak back to you, and then you're gonna be accountable for what he speaks. That's why many people are sitting in pews doing nothing, because it's far easier for me to just sit and be quiet and not be accountable to anything than for me to get before God, hear what he has to say, and now I'm accountable for what he told me. That's tough, amen? So, this is the heart of God. God cares about his people. God cares about his temple. What is the spiritual condition 
the people, the individuals who call themselves by the name of Christ and what is the condition of the temple. So God cares about both the individual and he cares about the church corporately, amen? And both of those things should grieve us, should affect us, or rather we should, we should ask the Lord to reveal to us because it, it determines uh, God's ability to, to guide and instruct us in how we're going to serve him in any 24 hour day. Remember, we're living in a day and an hour where ministry is not Wednesday and Sunday. Ministry is all day. This is one of the hardest things about the world we live in and the day that we live in because the world is moving so fast and the pressures are so great. We say, Lord, I don't have time. I have to do this. I have to go there. The Lord is looking for a weeping man. The people are in distress is the answer. The people are in distress. The church is in distress right now, saints. The church is in distress. If you can't see that, I pray God would show it to you. The church is in distress. Now this church may not be in distress, amen. Thank God for Pastor Kobe, Pastor Luis, all the other servants and ministers here, thank God for that. But the church is in distress and you should care. I should care. We should care about the condition of the church. There's no fruit. All right, that's what's happening here. There's, he's saying the, the people are, uh, uh, he says, uh, da, 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 da. the people are in great distress and reproach. That's the condition. The people are in great distress and reproach. And the city has no walls. What does that mean? Well, here's what I wrote. The city has no walls means the world has fully breached the church. We have no power or authority to resist the pressure of wickedness and lawlessness. Proverbs 25, 28, I share this with the men that I serve often. Like a city broken down and without walls, so is a man who cannot rule or govern his spirit. And a church without walls, a church where the walls are broken down and the world has come in, we have no authority to resist. We, we can't stand against the pressure of wickedness. Don't we see the body of Christ giving in and caving to every assault that the world imposes on us? The world says, you need to receive and believe this. And we say, oh, it doesn't feel right, but all right, we'll do it. I know I probably shouldn't, but all, all right, well, we just won't do it all the way. Amen. We'll, 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 you understand what I'm saying? I don't want to have to get into it because that's not the point of my message. But we need to understand, the world is coming in like a flood against us, and they know they have our number. They know that we'll cave if they will simply apply, apply enough pressure. So when we talk about being constrained to the Word of God, constrained to the character and the nature of God, are you able to stand in this present evil day and having done all to stand? The, we, the church, does not have the authority to resist the pressure of wickedness and lawlessness. I'm speaking across the board, obviously, the church, you know, God's church. Now, what, what's the second thing? So that's point number one. Nehemiah asks about the condition of the people and the city and the temple. He gets an answer. The people are in distress. The city has no walls. Now, what is Nehemiah's response? Well, I'll tell you what. This is one of the, one of the areas the Lord confronts me on. Because... I, you know, I read the news, you watch the news, we all, we all know what's going on. We're not, we're not blind to what's happening. And you know what we do? We say, this is just terrible. I can't believe the condition of the world. What is going on? This is just horrible. God needs to do something. And, I, you know, I should do something too. But at the end of the day, after all our talking, right, we can, we can sit down, I sit down with you over a cup of coffee. Oh, can you believe the things that are happening? Can you believe this and what they're doing over here? Can you believe this and what we're doing over here? And we feel so good about it. It's so spiritual. We have this little spiritual time where we're, you know, uh, getting out, you know, getting into all the things of God and we, we can say this and we can say that. But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, we do nothing. We get up from the cup of coffee and we start living our lives and we just get right back to it. Nehemiah didn't do that. Nehemiah didn't just talk about what was going on. He fasted, he wept, he fasted, and he prayed. He wept. The condition of the city grieved him. The condition of the temple grieved him. He wept and mourned for days. Are you weeping and mourning over the condition of the people and the condition of the church? 
and the condition of the temple? Does it grieve you? Because God's looking for someone like that. God's looking for someone who will just lay down and say, I can't believe it. Lord, until you do something, until you move, until you touch us. He wept, he fasted, and he prayed. All sacrificial. All sacrificial. So, the, the condition grieves Nehemiah to the point of tears and a righteous response. So again, well, let's just continue. The third thing is that Nehemiah's heart is gripped. Nehemiah, when he hears this, again, we're talk, remember, we're talking about that idea, that, that imagery of being bound to something. When Nehemiah hears the condition, he doesn't draw back from it and lament over it from a distance. He comes into it and binds himself to it and says, until this changes. Amen? Because that's what I was talking about before. It's easy to look back, to look at a distance and say, oh, I just, you know, oh, that's just so terrible. No, Nehemiah says, I'm coming in. I'm gripped. I'm confident in the character of God. The next thing that Nehemiah says is, God is awesome. Great and awesome God. Great and awesome God. Great and awesome God. Great and awesome God. Holy are you, Lord God. Glory to you, Lord God. I'm not looking at the church and I'm not looking at the people through my own eyes. I'm looking through the God of heaven. Great and awesome God. He preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Nehemiah is convinced of God's faithfulness to his covenant and his own character through righteousness expressed by obedience. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to the prayer of your servant. Amen. Nehemiah had faith. Nehemiah knew that if he prayed, and his, he was, uh, you know, Nehemiah didn't, didn't look up, <laughs> Nehemiah didn't look at himself and say, hey, look at me, I'm a weeping man. No, Nehemiah just wept. And that's the difference, all right? I'm not, we're not looking for, we're not looking for a ministry that puts us in front of people. And very often, uh, unfortunately, in, in the, I'm just telling you how it is, very often there are people who are just simply looking to express, they have something good to say, but along with their desire to express that good thing, they want a little glory. They want to set themselves and be the one who's, who says, look at me, I, got, I know what people need. Look at me, I know what to say. Hey, look at me, I look good. I got the answer here. Come and listen to me. Come and listen to me because I've heard from God. Now that may offend you. You may not understand what I'm saying. Maybe you do, maybe it offends you, but I'm just telling you right now, a servant could care less about what is seen. Nehemiah didn't care about that. He cared about the end, the outcome. He cared about the change, the transformation. And he had faith in God. Now, number four, Nehemiah understands the condition of the people in the city is because of their sin. It's not because they're psychologically broken. They're psychologically wounded. It's not because they've had a hard life. It's not because this and because of that. There's no justification. It's our sin that has brought us to this place. Confessing the sins of the Son of Israel, which we have sinned against you. And my Father's house, I, Nehemiah says, me and my Father's house, we have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you. We have not kept the commandments, the statutes, the ordinances that you commanded your servant Moses. The glory of God shows up when we're tr truthful about the condition of sin. The glory of God shows up when we, right? That's what Jesus says in John 3, 21. He says, those who do the truth, they come into the light that it may be revealed that their works are wrought in God. Don't stay in the dark. Don't stay in the darkness, church. Don't stay in the darkness. Come into the light. Let God work in you. Let God's glory be revealed to you so that you can be changed, amen? Nehemiah understood this. He understood that if he brought the sin of the people before God, if he acknowledged it fully, we have sinned against you. 
that God would respond. Nehemiah knows, this is number five, Nehemiah knows God's promises and his character that God will be faithful to himself. Listen to this passage from 2 Timothy, right? This is just fantastic. This is Paul speaking, obviously. He says, for this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those that are chosen. For this reason, I endure all things. A weeping man endures all things. A weeping man endures all things. A weeping man endures rejection. A weeping man endures criticism. A weeping man endures no response. A weeping man is bound to the God that he's, that he's weeping before, not to himself or to the circumstance. He's not bound to that. He's bound to God. And so for this reason, Paul says, uh, uh, yeah, so for this reason, uh, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they also, hallelujah, they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. What a position of faith that you also out there in Peabody, amen, that you also may obtain the salvation and all endure for your sake. Now, I know I'm preaching to myself. I'll tell you this straight up, right? The whole thing is, is I'm just telling you, God, God help us. May the Lord help us, amen. <clears throat> uh, let me finish. <clears throat> For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithful, or faithless rather, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Nehemiah knew this. Nehemiah knew that God couldn't deny himself. And that was his confidence. Lord, I know if I come to you by, in faith, you're gonna be faithful to yourself. Isn't that powerful? What are you facing today? What are you up against, amen? Do you know that God will be faithful to his own word, that he's bound himself to his word, amen? We have the authority and the right to go before God and receive from God the things that are promised to us by God in his word. Second Peter tells us very plainly, according as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, according to the one who called us by glory and virtue, whereby are given unto you and me exceeding great and precious promises. So that what? So that by them you partake of this divine nature and escape this corruption. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, Lord, show us. Open our eyes. Open my eyes today, Lord Jesus. Nehemiah is not shaken by the impossibility of the situation. Now look at we're talking about major destruction here, amen? This is point number six. He's, uh, when the, the city is in a bad place, all right? And the world, we look out on the world and we can say legitimately, my God, who can touch this? It looks impossible out there. This is madness. Whether it's the lost and dying world or it's the church in sin, who can do anything? But Nehemiah is not affected by that. He's not, he's not shaken by the impossibility of the present spiritual condition of the people. He's fixed on God alone. And he knows that, that if he will repent, that God will receive his prayer. Nehemiah understands the power of repentance in his own humility before God. That's his confidence. I know that if I will repent, God will acknowledge my repentance because that's who he is. And you can intercede and plead for people in their place. That's what an intercessor is, standing in the gap, amen, between someone who has no capacity to move on their own. If they could move on their own, they'd do it. But an intercessor says, God, I come on behalf of this person or this church, and I ask you, Lord God, do something according to your nature, your character, your faithfulness. Move in us. Move in them, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the remote parts of the heavens, hallelujah, I will gather them from there and bring them back to the place that I've chosen. God says, I'm going to find my people. I'm going to find them and I'm bringing them back. The last thing is that his prayer and his faith are directed and set on taking whatever action is required, even if it means losing his life. This would be, remember I talked when I started about a little a line that we need, little lines we draw for ourselves. I hear the message, 
I believe the message. Now I have to act on the message. That's where the Lord is dealing with me. So believe me when I tell you, and I say this, I say it because I know it's true. The Lord says to me, when he gave me this message, you're not this man. You're not a weeping man. So I'm talking loudly. I'm doing what preachers do. But I'm not living this out. Are you? Are we living it out? I have four examples in addition to Nehemiah. Those are the seven points that I drew. The last point, as I said, is action, whatever action is required. He said, I beseech you, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today. Grant him compassion before the king. Let your ear be attentive to the prayer. Those who delight Revere your name and make me, your servant, successful. You see, that's the simplicity of being a weeping man. All you have to do is ask. All you have to, right, God, the supply is up to God. It's not up to me. It's not up to me. I can't do it. The Lord can do it. The Lord has the power to take me where he wants to take me. The Lord has the power to animate me and bring me into those dark places, those broken places. But we look at ourselves. Now, I, th I feel like, uh, I, don't, I didn't bring my phone up. How are we doing on time? I, <laughs> I'm just gonna try to kind of edit this next section here. I have four, four examples of uh, weeping, weeping men I wanna share with you. I should say three more. There were four altogether. Nehemiah is the first. The Lord gave me Nehemiah because I believe Nehemiah, even though there's language that we're going to hear here that is quite a bit more passionate and emotional, the truth is that Nehemiah, I believe those seven points are, are pretty, pretty, pretty confident, right? Pretty strong. That, that it follows a process that a weeping man, uh, the heart and the, and the response that a weeping man gives, okay? And so I thank the Lord for Nehemiah and that passage and what those things that he showed me because they, they, they give me faith. And I pray that they give you faith. Amen. May they give you faith today. Yeah. Ezra, who is one of, uh, you know, Nehemiah's compatriots, right? They're contemporaries. Ezra is a weeping man because when the temple had been built, after all that God had done, this is chapter 10 of Ezra. After all that God had done, right? So Nehemiah starts this thing. They started together. And so we have this prayer that is early in the, in the condition because now in, uh, in Ezra chapter 10, the temple is built. The Lord has moved powerfully. And yet the people immediately sin. So let's listen to what Ezra says. The problem that Ezra is confronting is intermarriage. Remember, we just talked about the, the walls. What do the walls do? They keep the world out. The walls keep the world out. Okay? So Ezra, after all that God has done, the temple being restored, the temple being dedicated, after all that they've done, the people still go and intermarry with the idolatrous nations, the idolatrous men and women that are in the land. And so Ezra says this, and uh, this is uh, just for a point of reference, Ezra chapter 9 actually. Uh, is where, because this Ezra 9 is when he hears the report. He says, when I heard this matter, I tore my garments and my robe. I pulled hair from my head and my beard, and I sat down appalled. And everyone who trembled at the word of God of Israel on account of the unfaithfulness of the exiles, they gathered themselves to me. Now this is one of the things that's very unique about Ezra, is Ezra's not alone, people are coming. The people have been touched, there are people in this transition from the time that Nehemiah started to the time that we're in Ezra 9, people's hearts had been converted by the power of God. They'd entered into the heart of God. Ezra wasn't alone, people came and gathered with him and wept with him, hallelujah. That's the power. 
We need that, amen. Sometimes you're a weeping man alone, but God help us. God, what a wonderful thing it would be if we could all come together and weep together, amen. Because how much more authority would we have from God? What a, what a strength and a confidence it would give us to be able to weep with someone next to me, to the right and the left, and say, let's come before our God. And that's what Ezra does. They gathered to me. I sat appalled until the evening offering. But at the evening offering, I rose from my humiliation. Listen for the points, right? What did Ezra do? Did he just sit there and weep? No, he began to act. He began to respond. I rose from my humiliation, even with my garment and my robe torn. I fell on my knees and I stretched out my hand before God. And I said, oh, my God. I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to you. My God, our iniquities have risen above our heads. Our guilt has grown even to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt on account of our iniquities. We, our kings, our priests, have given themselves into the hand of the kings of the land, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, to open shame as it is this day. And now... This incredible thing, listen, I don't have time to break all this down for you, but Ezra says something very powerful here. He says, now for a brief moment of grace from the Lord our God, you have given us to escape this remnant and you've given us a peg in the holy place. Nehemiah understands this may not last. This is, we're in a season. We're in a season. Now this season, I believe, is gonna end, brothers and sisters, with the return of the Lord. So you need to recognize we're in a time frame. All right, I can't sit down right now. I have to be a weeping man because we're in a time frame where Jesus is gonna come and the world is gonna be left behind. There's a time frame. And Ezra says, now for a brief moment, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us an escaped remnant and to give us a peg in this holy place. Hallelujah. To give us a peg. What is that? It's a fortified place that cannot be moved. It's a fortified place that cannot be moved. We are in the place of authority, brothers and sisters. We are not the weak ones on the outside just saying, oh, who can do something? No, we have the power of the living God on our side. The Lord has given us the rock of Jesus. He's given us a peg in this holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our bondage. I'm gonna go ahead and stop there, okay? So, isn't that powerful? You can finish it, uh, Ezra 9, 3 to 15. The next one uh, really captivated me. When I read this, I was like, whoa, this is crazy. It's Elisha in King in 2 Kings 8. Elisha in 2 Kings 8. If you wanna turn there, you can. Uh, we're starting in verse 7. This is an interesting thing because I, I feel one of the things that I found beautiful about this particular example is that it's Elisha, you know, Elisha and, and Elijah, they dealt with uh, the people. On a, you know, they were called they were prophets. They're interacting with people, the, the corporate group. But Elisha has this very interesting encounter with one man. And the Holy Spirit reveals something to Elisha about this one man. And Elisha weeps. We need to be able to do that. We need to have the gifts of the Spirit active in our lives. You want to know why the church, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm using this phrase and I'm using it intentionally. You want to know why much of the church hates the Holy Spirit? No, they would never say they hate the Holy Spirit, but you better believe they hate the Holy Spirit because they have taken this word and they have said, this does not apply to us right now. God have mercy on those who would say the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit are not for this hour. God have mercy on the church that would say the Holy Ghost has no place in this hour of darkness. We're just going to sit and have our theology and have our Bible study. And, you know, it's up to God. God's sovereign. It's up to him. He'll do it. Yeah, we're just going to sit back. We're going to stay in our church. No, Elisha has an encounter with a man. The Holy Ghost reveals something to him, and Elisha weeps. Starting in verse 7 of chapter 8, 2 Kings. Elisha went to uh, Dem Demesek. Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, was ill, and he was told... The man of God has come here. The king said to Hazael, take with you a gift. All right, so the king is sick, okay? Take with you a gift. 
Go and meet the man of God and consult Adonai. Oh, by the way, I just want to tell you, I'm reading from the Jewish Bible on this one. And I, 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 I just wanted to share that with you so you know the translation's a little different. The king says, take with you a gift, go and meet the man of God and consult Adonai through him. Ask if I will recover from this illness. So here we have a man in faith is sending a servant to go see the man of God, to see the prophet Elisha. Okay? The king is in faith. He sends a man to, uh, to inquire. Now, the, the man does what he was at, what was asked of him. Hazael went to meet Elisha, meet the man of God, taking with him a gift that included every good, uh, every good Damasek had, 40 camels, 40 camels full. And he came and he stood before him and he said, right, now he's standing before Elisha, your son Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to you and he asks you, will I recover from this illness? There's the question, will I recover? Elisha answers and go, to, go and say to him, you surely will recover even though Adonai has shown me that he will surely die. So Elisha, saints, this is what I'm talking about. I'm bringing this to us because we need to be real-time Christians, able to live in Christ in real time. All right, we have to. We have to be able to hear the voice of God. When the Lord says, that person just needs a God bless you, or the Lord says, I want you to go and pray for that individual. All right, we need to be able to do it. I'm, I'm using this as an example to highlight that particular quality of a weeping man. It's a man who weeps in, 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 the, in the small thing, right? He's not just weeping for the great thing. He's just simply, he'll weep. He'll weep whenever the heart of God is revealed to him. Amen? There's a tenderness. Now, Elisha answers and he says, go and say to him, you will recover, even though Adonai has shown me that he will surely die. So we have good news and we have bad news. The good news is you're going to get better. The bad news is you're going to die. Very strange. But then the man of God fixed his gaze on Hazael. Elisha just looked. He just beheld Hazael. He just looked and he listened. Now, I know I'm adding some things here, but I want you to understand. This is what a weeping man does. He looks and he listens. And the man of God fixed his gaze on him so long that Hazael became embarrassed. In other words, Elisha's stare into Hazael's eyes and into his heart began to make him uncomfortable because the Holy Ghost was giving discernment on what this man was about to do. We need to be able to have that quality. And so Hazael, on his side, he, the, 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 the conviction and the discomfort of the Holy Spirit are at work in him. But on Elisha's side, okay, it says, uh, the man of God fixed his gaze on him for so long, Hazael became embarrassed. Finally, Elisha began to cry. Elisha began to cry. And Hazael asked, why is my Lord crying? And he answered, because I know the disasters you will bring on the people of Israel. You will set their fortresses on fire. You will kill their young men with a sword. You will dash their little ones to pieces and rip their pregnant women apart. Hazael said, but what is your servant? Nothing but a dog? How could he do anything of such a magnitude? And Elisha answered, Adonai has shown me that you will be king over Aram. Now, Hazael leaves Elisha, returns to his master, who asked and inquired, what did Elisha say? Hazael says, the Lord told me he would, you would surely recover. And the very next day, this man, Hazael, took a blanket and he dipped it in water and he suffocated King Aaron and killed him. Elisha wept in a one-on-one -on -one encounter over the condition and the things that God saw. We need to be able to do that. The last one is Josiah. I'm, I, I'm, I can edit this down very, you know, pretty simply. That we're in Second Kings uh, chapter 23. If you're not familiar with Josiah, just an incredible man. He's always captivated, always captivated. 
Because the scripture says of him, and we're going to read the one verse that, that, caught, that, that just lifts up and, and magnifies the, the character of King Josiah. We'll read it when we're done. But listen to what happens, right? Josiah is a, a weeping man, and he's a weeping man. Remember those qualities in Nehemiah's prayer where Nehemiah sets his hand to action, right? The response isn't just move him emotionally. It moves him to act in response to an obedience to God. A weeping man will always obey. A weeping man will always do, amen? Moreover, so we're starting in uh, 2 Kings 22, verse 10. Moreover, Shaphan, the scribe, told the king and said, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. Remember what? What is it? It's the word of God. The word of God is about to come to a king and it's about to expose the lawlessness and the rebellion and the condition of the people. That's exactly what happened with Nehemiah. Nehemiah saw the condition and now Josiah is in the exact same place. The law is going to come, hallelujah. How do you determine the condition of the people, brothers and sisters? By the word of God, not by the word of the world. You see, the world will tell you this person is traumatized and they need this and they need psychology. We need to get some counseling sessions set up and we need to, right? I'm not putting that stuff down, saints, but let me tell you something. I'd rather have the power of God. You see, the world doesn't tell me what a person needs. God tells me what a person needs. And the world doesn't tell me what determines a broken condition and what sin is. God tells me what the broken condition and the, and the, and, and the sin is. So this is why this is so significant. I hope that you're seeing all of these things line up in that Nehemiah framework. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And then he commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahakam, the son of Shaphan, uh, go, and this is what he said, sorry, go and inquire of the Lord for me. And the people of all Judah concerning the words of, book, of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us. Go and inquire. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us. Because our fathers have not kept and listened to the words of this book according to all that is written. Now, let me just set something in front of you that's going to uh, possibly offend you. It will certainly offend many. And that is... The wrath of the Lord burns against us. What are you talking about? The wrath of the Lord burns against us. Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again. What are you talking about? The wrath of the Lord burns against us. The Lord doesn't care what we do anymore. The Lord doesn't care about all, you know, he, you know, he wants us to change. He wants us to do, to do better. But the wrath of the Lord against us, what are you talking about? Have you read Revelation chapter 2 and 3? Have you read about the Laodicean church and God spitting them out of his mouth? You don't think the wrath of the Lord is burning against some in his church right now? So Hilkiah the priest went to hold of the prophetess, the wife of Shalem, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. And they spoke to her and she said to them, this is what the Lord says. Tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord. Behold, I bring evil on this place and its inhabitants, even the words of the book which the king of Judah has read. Okay, in other words, God is gonna be faithful to his own word, amen? Again, you can't spin it. Don't, don't try to run from it. Don't try to reframe it to make yourself feel better. If God has spoken it, it will come to pass. My wrath burns against this place, and it shall not be quenched. But to the weeping man, to King Josiah, the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what you will say to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke in my word against this place, that you would become a desolation as a curse, you tore your clothes and you wept before me. You tore your clothes and you wept before me and I heard you, hallelujah. You tore your clothes and you wept before me and I heard you, says the Lord. I knew your heart was sincere before me and I've heard your prayer. Therefore, I will gather you to your fathers. You will be gathered to your grave in what? In peace. 
you'll be gathered to your grave in peace. It's called Passover, saints. Amen. The wrath of God passing over. Now, if you haven't read uh, 2 Kings 22 and 23, you've got to read it. Okay, It's just one of the most incredible stories. Josiah does everything. Nothing is left out. Nothing is left out. He does all that is required. He kills those that need to be killed. He tears down those things that need to be torn down. Everything that the instruction of the word of God co that comes to him, he responds. You see, that's where the church would have the power that it needs. When we're willing, beginning with ourselves, to do whatever is required. When we, beginning with ourselves, will do whatever is required, the power of God will begin to move and flow through us, and then we'll have the authority that we need to enter into the darkness and say, now God's going to touch you. But when you're in a place where, you're, uh, where you have mixture and compromise, I'm getting ahead of my message, but fundamentally, we have to be doers. We've got to respond. Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise afterward. Talk about a testimony. Can you imagine in the whole Bible, the Bible says, right, not, there's just a handful of people where the Bible says there was no one like this man, no one like this, bird, this woman. Isn't that amazing? That, that, that over the history of humanity, God says, this person has reached such a place in relationship with me that there was no one like them in all of humanity. My God. Don't you, do you hunger for that? Do you want that? We're not talking about our self-glory. We're talking about loving righteousness and hating lawlessness. That's all God's asking for. That's what a weeping man does. He loves righteousness and he hates lawlessness. Now, the question that I have here, we're, we're actually doing pretty good. How are we doing? Are you all right? <laughs> Here's what we have next. Why don't we weep? Why aren't we weeping men? Why aren't we weeping women? Again, I, I don't know you, so please know I'm not ascribing to you that you're not a weeping man or woman. You very well may be. I hope and pray that you trust that you are. But why don't we weep? The first reason, I believe, is simply unbelief. The greatest sin that grieves the heart of God more than any substance, right? You're a crack addict. Does the Lord want you delivered from that? Of course. You, you use substances. You look at things. You do things. You say things. Does the Lord have, have issue with that? Of course. Does he call us out of that? Of course. But this is what the Lord hates. He hates unbelief. He hates it. Because Jesus Christ was crucified and rose from the dead. And if that's not enough to prove to you that God is able to do all things, the one who opened his mouth and said, I'm the resurrection and the life, whoever believes in me, even though they were dead, yet shall they live. And those who believe in me, even though uh, uh, when they die, that when they live, they'll never die. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is everything. Jesus says everything is possible to him who would believe. Okay? Unbelief. The Son of Man... When the Son of Man comes, nevertheless, I think it is Luke 17, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, what, will he find faith on the earth? So we say things like, God can't use me. God shouldn't use me. You see our unbelief, looking at ourselves? What he's asking me to do is impossible. Are you looking at yourself? Why? Who are you? Who are you before God? The scripture teaches that we're actually simply vessels. Now, now that, can, that, that may rub you wrong because we love the, the emotional connection that Jesus has with us, and he does have an emotional connection with us. But the truth is, if, 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 and I pray to God that God would help his church to understand this, in this life, we're actually simply called to be servants and vessels that are expendable at the request of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We are vessels to be used however God sees fit. Paul says this very thing, amen? In a great house, there are many vessels, some to honor, some to, is, to dishonor. Those who are unto honor, they sanctify themselves, amen? They purify themselves. God, and the last one, unbelief, God is asking too much for me. 
too much. This is too much. I can't do that. It's too much. I can't go there. I can't speak that. I can't say that. I can't pray that. You're looking at yourself, brother, sister. I'm, you're looking at yourself, Doug. Right. Amen. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to me. The Holy Spirit will talk to you. God is asking too much from me. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that, okay? Unbelief. First, one of the primary reasons we don't weep. Second is, this is too hard. Listen to what Jeremiah says. When I say this is too hard, now I've already referenced too hard, but Jeremiah in particular communicates a, a challenge to being a weeping man that, and this is where the rubber really hits the road. This is what really gets us. Listen to what Jeremiah says. When I say it's too hard, it's too hard because the persecution and the suffering that are gonna follow a weeping man are intense. It's no joke. You wanna be a weeping man? Believe me, you're gonna be hated. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're gonna hate you. And we live in a world and we live, quite frankly, in a church that is obsessed with being loved. Oh, don't hate me, don't dislike me. All right, well, I'll dial it back a little bit. I know I can, look, 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 I'm just telling you, saints, I've heard it from pulpits all across this community, all across this region. And when I lived in California, when I listened online, pastors and preachers who apologize for the very thing they preached after they preached it. What in the world is going on? I'll dial it back, right? I had someone, I heard someone say, uh, you know, well, a bunch of people, uh, did, you, uh, did you think that message was too hard? I had a bunch of people come to me. They were telling me, uh, boy, you know, pastor, we don't really like where, you know, you're, you're getting a little too much for us here. Should I dial it back? Really? A weeping man can't dial it back. A weeping man, a weeping woman can't dial it back. There's no choice. Because why? When we started, we're constrained to his character and his word. We've bound ourselves to him. That's what a bond slave is, amen? Someone who has bound themselves to their master. That's what a weeping man is. That's what a weeping woman is. Someone who has bound, constrained themselves to whatever the master says. Oh Lord, this is Jeremiah 27 to 13. Lord, you have deceived me and I was deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed. I have been a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. Each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction because for me, the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. But if I say, listen, please, you know this, some of you know this. If I say I will remember him no more and I will no longer speak his name, if I say, that's it, I can't do it. If, if I say, Lord, that's it, it's enough. I can't be hated like this anymore. I can't be an outcast anymore. I can't suffer the mocking. I can't suffer the ridicule. I can't suffer the loss of friendships. I can't suffer it. I can't do it if I try to just shut it down. So, Lord, I'm just drawing back now. It's going to be just myself. And, and Jeremiah says, if I, I will, if I say I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones. In other words, you can't run from the will of God. You can't run from the call of God. I am weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. I cannot endure it, for I have heard the whispering of many. Terror on every side. Denounce him denounce him all my trusted friends watching for my fall and they say perhaps he will be deceived then we can prevail against him and take our revenge but the Lord is with me like a dread champion therefore my persecutors will stumble and not prevail they will utterly be ashamed because they have failed that's who the Lord is on your side the Lord's on your side amen the Lord's always on the side of a weeping man the Lord's always on the side of a weeping woman. It doesn't matter how hard it gets. It doesn't matter how much persecution there is. The next reason why we don't weep is because of mixture. Idolatry, spiritual adultery, love of the world. You can't be a weeping man and love the world and the things of the world. You can't be a weeping woman and, and, and live in, in mixture. 
powerlessness, unbelief, and unanswered prayers. Now, I know what it, 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 it's, it's very easy to say, well, you know, to stand here and make a statement like that, okay? I could point the finger and say, hey, we're all, you know, you're in mixture, whatever. Look, this is where most of us wrestle. Because mixture to us is not necessarily what mixture is to the Lord. We say, I don't look at those movies. I don't watch those things. I don't drink those things. I don't use those things. So there's no mixture in me. But how do we comfort ourselves? How do we relax? What does mixture look like? Look like? Like I said, this can be a hard thing to say. Maybe you disagree with me. That's fine. We can talk about it. But I'm just telling you, there's much of the world, there's a lot of mixture that is innocuous on the surface. In other words, you could come to my house at any given time, and I can I tell you honestly, you could watch TV with me. I would not have to change my TV habits for you to come watch television. But then we're looking at a weeping man and we have to ask ourselves, why am I watching television at all? What benefit? Remember what the Lord said to me. He said, you're not this man. Now, I'm not setting that out there because I want to condemn you. I don't know your life. I don't know your story. Amen. You see, this is an invitation. The Lord doesn't despise the ones who don't answer the invitation. But the invitation still stands. That was from the Lord right now, amen. The Lord doesn't despise the one who doesn't respond to the invitation to be a weeping man or a weeping woman, but the invitation's still there. And some of us have heard it. We, we, some of us, it's like a fire in our bones, amen. It's like a fire. Jesus. Oops. <laughs> Jesus. Paul is speaking to the Corinthians. He says, our mouth has spoken freely to you. Paul is pleading with the Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You're not restrained by us. You're restrained by your own perfection. The thing that hinders and frustrates the things that you're actually want in Christ, it's your own affection, your own desires. Now, like an exchange, I speak to you as children. Open wide to us. Don't be, un, don't be yoked together. Don't be bound with unbelievers. What partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? What fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Satan? What is a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? We are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch the unclean thing. I will welcome you, hallelujah. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. The children of God are weeping. The children of God should be all weeping, amen. So like I said, the invitation stands. Jesus, help us. James says, you know what James says, all right? He says, look, quarrels and conflicts, why? Is it not the source of pleasure that wages war inside you? You lust and you don't have, you commit murder, you're envious, you cannot obtain, you fight and you quarrel. You don't have because you don't ask, okay? You ask and you don't receive because you're asking with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. You're an adulterer. You have friendship with the world. It's hostility toward God. 
So if you want to be a friend with God, if you want to be a weeper, you can't make friend the friendship with the world. You're an enemy of God at that point. And what does friendship like the world look like to you? I don't know. Only the Holy Ghost can convict you of that. But I guarantee you right now, every single person, from the pastor to me to everybody else, there's friendship with the world somewhere in us, and the Lord is saying, will you let me have it? Will you let me have it? Will you draw a little closer to me? Will you come in just a little closer? Because I have something for you. The great lie of the devil to blind us from what's on the other side of crossing the line. I, I can't cross the line. I'll just stay here. Hey, look what I'm doing, right? Look, I'm in prison ministry, okay? I, I send 500 subscriptions of Hope Mail out. I go to the jail and I preach three days a week. Right? Hey, I direct this ministry. I have discipleship. And, hey, I'm online and I'm doing the prison ministry prayer campaign. And all these, look at all that I'm doing. Hey, you know what? Let somebody else do that. Right? I'm already doing enough. Oh, really? If you only knew what would happen if you crossed the line. If you only knew what God had for you on the other side. There's more. I referenced... Uh, King Asa earlier in the very beginning of the message, the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the whole earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. From now on, you will have war. King Asa was a very interesting man because he begins his story, his faith, believing God. He believes God for a great deliverance and God gives him a great deliverance. But then a th another threat comes, something that his perception says, that's too much. God may not show up. I got to deal with it on my own terms. I got to walk in the wisdom of man. So I'm going to go to this king and I'm going to ask Syria for help. Yeah, Syria is my answer. There you go. That'll do it. And so the Lord sends a prophet after Syria. And Syria does what King Aram was looking for, or King Asa was looking for. He, the, the, the plan worked, right? Syria did exactly what Asa asked them to do. Isn't that interesting? That when Asa went to the world, the world gave Asa what he wanted. Oh, may the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, that's a word for somebody. When you went to the world, the world gave you what you wanted. And you know what that did? It cooled your heart towards God. It robbed you. It began to suck away the desperation. Because you realized, the world will give me what I want. This seeking God thing, that's rough, right? Look at Jeremiah, amen? This seeking God thing is tough, man. I, being a weeping man, that's rough. So what was the judgment against King Asa? Separation from the Lord. You lost my intimacy with me. You lost my presence. The Lord judged his unbelief and rejection of him. And King Asa's heart, as soon as he, this word came from the prophet, his heart was converted, he became bitter, he became angry, and he became an oppressor. He actually began to bring destruction to God's people. Because, why? Because he had lost his intimacy. Isn't that amazing? Bitterness of spirit, depression, weakness, lack of authority, torment from resisting the call, eternal ruin. Are you in bitterness of spirit today because you're not a weeping man or a weeping woman? I'd like to say I am. I know as I've been making this message, you know, she's been dealing with me, man. It's rough. It's rough. Because it's out there for every single one of us. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care where you're from. The invitation stands to every single person. <clears throat> I'm going to close with two invitations from the Bible. In this generation, I repeat the beginning of my message in the final hours and minutes before Christ's return. The Holy Spirit is sending out Christ's invitation. Who will serve as I serve? Who will love as I love? Who will declare my word as I am? Who will declare my word as I am? James says, therefore confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. 
And Elijah was a man just like us, right? With a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would rain, and it did not rain. Supernatural. And then he prayed again, and the sky poured down rain and produced its fruit. Elijah's just like you. He's just like me. But we have to confess our sins one to another. We have to pray for one another so that we can be healed. So that this message and the barriers between us and, and the, the fulfillment of being a weeping man or a weeping woman, this message has a place of entrance. And we are in agreement. Lord, we don't know how to get there. Amen. Some of you, maybe right now, this is bearing witness with you, but you say, I don't know how to get there. Look, just start taking, just start walking. And, and join yourself to others who are of like minded, like, like precious faith. Amen. We're going to join ourselves to one another. We're going to believe God. We all are going to become weeping men and women. We're going to. Uh, believe God to affect this generation. We're going to believe God to touch this generation. All right. I'm laughing because I had eight pages of notes and my, the last thing that I wanted to do is like a page and a half. So you need to give me the thumbs up. I don't, what time is it? I don't know. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now you tell me. Let me read to you from the Apostle Paul. Uh, let, me give you, let me give you a homework assignment, all right? The weeping man assignment. <laughs> the weeping man homework assignment is Isaiah 51, 1 to 8. And Isaiah 50, 1 through 11. Okay, make a note of it. Isaiah 50, 1 to 11. Isaiah 51, 1 to 8. That's your weeping man homework assignment. We're going to close with the words of the Apostle Paul out of Acts chapter 20. When they came to Paul, he said to them, You know yourselves from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Saints, I, 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 let me pray. I have to pray really quickly. Father, I ask you to help each person, myself included, to hear this closing word. It's not time to draw back. It's time to listen. The Lord is giving an invitation. It's time to respond to the invitation. Father, help us. The spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. And we repent of that, Lord God. And we believe you, Holy Spirit, to animate us and give us and enable us to be the men and women that we are not currently. Oh, help us, oh God. Help us, oh God. Help us, Father, in the name of Jesus. I did not shrink back from declaring anything to you that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house, solemnly testifying to the Jews and the Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's all God's asking of you. That's how we're ministers, is it not? We preach the gospel, repent, <laughs> believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will what? You will be saved. That's God's work to do. The saving, the specifics is God's work. It's not your work. Now, behold, I am bound in spirit. I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city and says that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not, my consider, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. Let me read that again. Holy Spirit, help me. I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. Holy Spirit, I do not consider my life of anything, any account. <laughs> help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. So that we may finish our course and the ministry we have received from the Lord Jesus would be fulfilled. Behold, I know that all of you 
among whom I went about preaching the kingdom of God will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole purpose and the counsel of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in in your own selves, in your own midst, and men will arise and they will speak perverse things and draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that day and night for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish you, each of you, with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those that are sanctified. This is my prayer for you, saints. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Because the one who sanctifies and the ones who are sanctified are all one. And he is not ashamed to call us his brethren. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, have your way now. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Father, move in our midst. We ask in Jesus' name, I thank you, and I give you glory. Amen. Saints, thank you for letting me share with you today. Hallelujah. Come on, give another round of applause. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who is that weeping man, that weeping woman? If it doesn't concern you how our generation is doing, you and I have a deep problem if it doesn't concern you. If it doesn't concern you, when the person next to you just commits suicide and it doesn't affect you, we have a deep problem. I believe God is calling us to be that weeping man, that weeping woman. Not just to cry, but to take action. Yes, yes, to yes, speak Lord. the word. Hallelujah. Help us, oh God. Help us, Maybe they didn't apply to you, but I feel convicted today. And I'm not afraid to be vulnerable in front of you and tell you that. I love the fact that God is still bringing conviction to his people. Hallelujah. Because otherwise, we may, may continue going astray, thinking that we're right. And then by the time we wake up, it's too late. But praise be to God, hallelujah, Amen. that he continues to speak to us. I know the Spanish service is about to come in, but what a word we received today. I counted some, some of the uh, specific citations from the Bible, from the book of Peter, Chronicles, Nehemiah, John, Jeremiah, Esther, Kings, Revelation, Luke, James, Acts, Ephesians, and Isaiah, and much more. A solid word from the scripture. Hallelujah. And I have some news for Reverend uh, Doug Gregan and Caroline. You're still going to be invited here. Hallelujah. <laughs> and let me tell you, this, this, this power and what I'm saying. If they preach what they're preaching here today and in so many places, they will not invite him anymore. Trust me when I tell you that. They will not extend an invitation because we can no longer tolerate sound teaching from the word of God. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet as we pray. Uh, they are still here. I know we're going to transition to another service, but if you want prayer, they're still here. They are a powerful couple. Um, when Minister Lucy introduced them, they're genuine people. And I think you said that today with Reverend Gregan. Genuine people. And they do not compromise. They're solid in their belief. And we need more men and women like that in, in our generation. People that will come and will not be afraid to challenge us. And tell us, will you be that man? Will you be that woman? Now you have to leave today with your mind made up that you're going to take some actions. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Because I believe the Lord spoke to us. Amen. 
Let us raise our hands to heaven and let us stand. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for this word, Father. If you call us to be that weeping man, that weeping woman, God, I pray in the name of Jesus that we will not resist the invitation, Father, because you talked, you spoke to us today, and you said that even when we rejected, the invitation stands, God, waiting for us to turn, Father, and receive it and begin to take action, Father. There's many ways, Father, that the church has been silent in so many issues, God, and I feel like this is a wake-up call father god for us to bring the light of christ father in this generation father that we will not be afraid father to stand for life god to stand for righteousness god regardless of the price that we have to pay god let us be the voice of righteousness god and understand that righteousness and loneliness father cannot co coexist god we must choose righteousness god despite of what the price and the cost shall be in our life father at the end of the day god even if it costs us our life our life is already yours jesus help us not to be afraid god help us to be a voice of righteousness god and help us to take action god as we heard from you today we love you in jesus name amen and amen god bless you saints hallelujah please make sure to come and greet reverend don and caroline today show your love and then the spanish service is going to be transitioning god bless you